But what I'm going to do tonight is to tell you um, about how animals learn, particularly how dogs learn. And I'm going to try to give you, and we got a really on time start, didn't we? Um, I'm going to try to give you um, a sense of some of the new data that are being developed and some of the places that um, my research is, is hoping to take this so that you know what's, what's out there and what's coming. And I'm hoping to do this to inform a way of thinking. Okay, what information is contained in vocal signals? You know, I've heard people say, just tell them to shut up, it's all noise. I know humans for whom I'm positive that's true, okay? <laughs> But I don't think that's true in dogs. In fact, I don't think that's true in any species, again, because the evolutionary biologist in me argues, mm, unlikely to have evolved. So what we have to do is begin to understand what dogs are saying. And these are two sonographs taken from a study of some of my patients. And the first is a control dog in a group of dogs that were being studied who had separation anxiety, who were distressed when they were left alone without their people. And the dog on top, and you can even see what the veterinary student wrote on this, um, that he runs to the window, because these are taken from videos. He runs to the window. She can't really see what's there. He sees something outside the window. He wags his tail, probably is human. And he gives this alerting bark that sounds like, Arr! OK? Now, you've all heard it, because you've all heard your dogs do it. Well, there's information contained in that bark. That bark indicates that you've recognized a known quantity and it tells other dogs where they are. That's a lot of information for one tonal shape. This dog, on the other hand, is one of the dogs with separation anxiety. And this was an important study because it allowed us to say to people, look, even if you don't have any technical equipment, press the record button on your answering machine as you're walking out the door. And if you hear this repetitive atonal sound from the dog. The dog probably has separation anxiety. Let me tell you what my version of behavior mod is not. It's not correction. It's not training. It's not learning by compulsion. It's not earn to learn. It's not a leadership program. It's not nothing in life is free. It's not adversarial. It's not painful. It's not tedious. And it's not scary for the dog or the human. You have to meet all of those requirements for me. Okay. True behavior mod involves standard techniques. There's no magic here. I wish I had magic. I really do. I would give anything to have magic. But it involves shaping behaviors. It involves classic desensitization and counter conditioning. But really what it does, and this is the key, is it involves replacing a set of rules that require reaction regardless of the context with a new set of rules that allow the animal to relax and to take his or her cue from the contextual environment. Um, I'm going to talk about behavioral pharmacology, and I'm going to focus on using medication in a matter that addresses how dogs and cats learn. I realize that the vast majority of you aren't veterinarians and can't prescribe drugs, but I do think it's incredibly valuable to know the underlying chemistry of these, and I think it's important to know in a practical sense what you can expect to happen, what you cannot expect to happen, what concerns there are. Because honestly, I think the best success between um, veterinarians and people who aren't veterinarians working together is going to come when they have a shared knowledge base. And in, you're going to find at times that vets don't know anything about drugs because they didn't go to a school that had a behavioral department. And unfortunately, that's the majority of vet schools. Only nine vet schools in North America have any type of what you could call full-time behavioral medicine program. So you can expect that the vast majority of veterinarians graduating from vet school don't know anything about behavioral drugs. And being able to refer them to papers and being able to talk um, intelligently about them without forcing yourself to tell them what they need to prescribe um, can can go quite far, and I've seen a lot of a lot of um, dog trainers make this successful, and that's one of the reasons I've included not only all the references for yesterday's talk on cognition in your notes, but I've included two original papers that I wrote, and you know some of the details might be a little painful for some of you to wade through, but the information's there, and you then have something else you can pass on to other people. Okay. 
to sum up, what do we still need to know? We don't know how most of these drugs work in dogs and cats. I can tell you the toxic levels of every single one of these drugs in dogs, and you can get that information yourself. Call the drug companies or look it up um, in the published record because all of the toxicology studies are done in dogs. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your viewpoint. It's one of those mixed issues. We don't have comparative studies on large populations. So, you know, we don't have these thousand people, multi-institution studies, and we need that. We don't know about breeds, individuals, polymorphic responses, especially in something called CPY enzymes, which are the ones that metabolize stuff in the liver. And we don't know the effects on learning trajectories when these are used in young animals. Okay. Now, I will tell you that the effects on learning trajectories in young animals will be positive. I will tell you that if your choice is to wait to treat or treat, treat, don't wait. I've treated animals as young as eight weeks of age, and there is now excellent data from the rodent literature that says you can prevent many problems and you can get neuronal growth if you treat young. 